Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm so happy that you're here again once uh, more to join us. We are in our block three, uh, week two of our summer uh, virtual teacher training sessions. Um, and this week we are uh, following along with last week and looking at row crops. So this is our second week of row crops. We hope that you guys all got your boxes for the first 50 people who uh, filled out the reflection. Um, I did make a small mistake on the little uh, half sheet of material items that you might need um, to participate in this week's activities. Uh, and I, for some reason, I was not thinking correctly, but I put you needed just one clear cup and I lied. And really what you need is two non-clear cups. So cups that you can't see through, cups or jars. Um, if you don't have anything like that, that is fine. Um, it, it's better to that you can't see through, but if you can, that's just fine. So take a couple minutes if you could go get two uh, non-clear cups or jars um, and we will get started in about uh, two minutes. I've got an extra All right, for those of you just joining us, uh, welcome back for our uh, Block 3 Week 2 um, Summer Teacher Virtual Training Session on row crops. Uh, I did make a small mistake on the items that you need to participate um, in our lesson, so if you could take a minute to go grab two non-clear uh, cups or jars or something small, um, it doesn't have to be very big, um, but we're going to get started in just one minute here. It looks like we've got a few more people joining us. Okay, we're gonna get started in about 30 seconds. Give everybody else a minute to gather their stuff, get ready. All right, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. So again, welcome back to Illinois Ag in the Classroom Summer Virtual Teacher Training Sessions. Um, if you've been with us the last few weeks, we have gone through um, a few different varieties of categories and talked all um, about agriculture and bringing this into your classroom. Last week, we started looking at row crops and uh, different uh, different parts about row crops, tillage, you know, uh, managing soil and all of that fun stuff. Um, we're hoping that you recognize and you can see see a connection between all of our themes. So when we're looking at natural, uh, natural resources, livestock, row crops, and then um, next week and the week after when we're looking at our specialty crops, we're hoping that you can see a connection between all of these themes. And obviously the number one thing is agriculture, but also looking at how agriculture is much more than just, you know, cows and red barns and that there is just so much that, um, that our agricultural uh, people are responsible for and how we as um, you know, civilians and community members uh, should be aware of this stuff and should um, should recognize how what we can do to play a role and help out. So, uh, welcome. And Chris is going to go ahead and get us started on our first activity. All right. Good morning, everybody. Our first activity that we're going to do with you is my little seed house. And so you can see here on the slide here, you need a couple things from your uh, box of goodies that we mailed you. You should have a copy of the, uh, the My Little Seed House template. Uh, you may have a separate sheet. It might also be tucked in with the lessons that are stapled together. So you might have to pull this page from that. So this is actually a lesson that's been adapted from uh, a National Ag in the Classroom lesson. And uh, if you haven't yet checked out the National Ag in the Classroom website, I'd recommend it. It's agclassroom.org. They have a lot of resources and they have a, a lesson matrix is what they call it. And they have 400 plus lessons on there that are from all across the country. It's a great place to, to find resources. And a lot of their lessons are really fully developed uh, units and multi-day lessons. 
Uh, if you're not looking for lessons like that, it's a really good place to get some ideas and maybe you can pick and choose some ideas from some of those lessons, but a lot of really great resources on there. They also have a store on there where you can buy classroom sets with materials for many other lessons. So it's, it's worth checking out if you're not familiar yet with the National Ag in the Classroom website. So this lesson today, my little seed, seed house is a, is a germination lesson. So we're gonna to start to talk to students about how seeds germinate. If you're familiar with our Beanie Baby lesson that's been around a long time, uh, where students uh, make a little necklace and they actually germinate uh, soybean seed uh, using their body heat. This is kind of a spin on that. And so if you take your paper here, and hopefully you've got some scissors there close by. And so the easiest way to do it is if you actually fold the paper in half, uh, and then you can just cut along those dotted lines. So we'll take a second here, fold that paper in half, and then cut out on the dotted line to create a little window in your seed house. And we're gonna use soybean seeds for this. Uh, soybeans are not necessary to do this with. However, they're a really important crop in Illinois. So it's a good opportunity to talk to students about uh, a crop that they probably drive by and see in the fields all the time, uh, you know, regardless of where you are in the state, if you're not too far from a soybean field. And so it's a great way to talk about that. This is an excellent lesson to connect with our soybean ag mag. Um, also, soybeans are a large seed. Uh, you've got a baggie here that has some cotton balls and some soybean seeds in it. So uh, it's really easy to see um, that seed germinate and you can see all the plant parts. So as that seed swells, it starts to split and you start to see the, the root and then the leaf start to pop out of it. And it's really easy to see with the naked eye. And so large seeds like soybeans work really well with like that. Um, any kind of bean or pea seed would also, would also work just fine too. But again, we like to do it with soybeans. All right, so you've got your, uh, your little seed house cut out. Now with students, if you wanted to get fancier and have them actually cut the house out, they could obviously decorate the house however they wanted to. Uh, that would be great to kind of individualize it for themselves. Then you're going to take your, your Ziploc bag and you've got some cotton balls in here. That might seem kind of strange, but we're going to use the cotton balls to absorb some, to absorb some moisture. So you're going to uh, open up your bag and you're going to just wet down those cotton balls with some water there. They don't need to be sopping wet. They need to, you know, have a decent amount of moisture in there, but you don't necessarily need like water, you know, standing at the bottom of the bag. As long as there's some moisture there, uh, that's totally fine. So once you get those cotton balls moistened, you can make sure they're in contact with those soybeans and seal that back up. I've also heard teachers talk about, they've done a variation of this lesson where they actually stapled through the bag and they had, uh, they rested the soybean seeds on top of the staples and allowed that. And then, then you could actually see the root come out below the staple and the soybeans start to grow above that. Another way you could possibly do this. So once you've got your, your cotton balls moistened, you're just gonna attach your uh, Ziploc bag. I've got tape here, tape would work, stapler, um, anything like that would work to attach it. And then you can see here, it's a pretty simple idea, right? That hole we cut creates uh, a window here. And then uh, one option would be to hang it in the window in your classroom and allow the sunlight to warm that up and to contribute to, to getting those seeds to germinate a little bit faster. This is also an opportunity that you could use to try to make this a little bit of, of an inquiry activity and an experiment here. You know, maybe you could try different liquids. Maybe you could have um, different temperatures. Some could go in the sunlight. Some could go in a dark drawer. There's lots of different variables that we could add to this to allow students to experiment with it and to, to turn that into a, to an inquiry-based activity as well. Uh, if nothing else, it's a great way to talk about seed germination and look at, uh, look at the importance of that and how seeds actually um, have everything they need inside of them, they just need the right conditions to be able to grow them. Um, on the first slide, Stephanie, if you wanna go back for just a moment, we've got a couple books that we really like to use with this activity. Oh, Say Can You See It is uh, from the Dr. Seuss Library. It's an excellent book about germination. It's, it looks like it would be you know, a first or second grade level text, but it actually goes into some high level uh, information regarding photosynthesis and how plants grow. And there's a lot of great vocabulary terms in there. So that's a book that I think, even though it looks young, you could easily use with older students. Uh, Pod to Plate is by Julie Blunier. That's a, a book that the uh, Illinois Soybean Association published a few years ago. Excellent book about soybean growth and, and has specific ties to Illinois. And then Full of Beans, How Henry Ford Grows a Car is by Peggy Thomas, one of our favorite authors. Uh, it's a book about how Henry Ford 
back uh, pre-World War II, designed a car made with soybean plastic powered by soy-based biodiesel. So a really fascinating story. There's lots of really great uh, back matter in there with actual pictures from that prototype that he built. And we're going to talk a little bit later this morning about some bioplastic information related to, to corn and soybeans as well. So we'll, we'll circle back to bioplastics. All right, so that is your, your germination activity using soybeans. My little seed house, again, compliments of the National Ag in the Classroom program. Okay, all right, moving right along. We are looking at wheat milling. Okay, so wheat, another uh, very common uh, row crop. And last week when we talked about it, um, we looked at there were five different varieties um, and we look at red winter wheat here in Illinois, but that um, every single country and every culture grows wheat. We're looking at a very popular row crop that has been with us, you know, for centuries. And there are different types of breads made all over the world from from these different varieties of, of plants um, and that they're harvested every month of the year, no matter where you, you know, depending on where you are um, in the world. So that was a really cool thing to learn about. Um, so our wheat milling activity, we just love this because it's getting kids um, a hands-on activity or a hands-on opportunity to actually uh, play around with a wheat stalk. Um, and so all of you guys should have gotten a little baggy with um, some wheat stalks in there. Um, before we go into the activity, I do want to point out some of these books. We have um, The Thing About Luck, which is a junior high uh, level novel. It would be appropriate for um, fifth grade, um, even maybe your stronger fourth grade readers um, looking at wheat harvesting, um, immigrant labor, uh, and a, a little family um, who the main character is a little girl and, you know, it's a coming of age book and her, what it feels like to have to be out, you know, harvesting wheat instead of, you know, being with her friends and what it's like to be different and um, have her Japanese background. And um, so there's a lot of really cool uh, story matter there with that. Um, Farmer George, uh, historical um, uh, book, we're looking again, fourth, fifth grade level, um, awesome information about uh, our uh, President George Washington. Um, from wheat to bread, we're looking at that supply chain. How do we get um, bread and how does that process go from starting with the wheat stalk and then ending with that final product? So looking at all parts in between. Um, and then Bread Lab is really fun, looking at how bread works, what makes it rise, looking at the yeast and all of that um, fun stuff. So these are some really uh, cool um, wheat books that we just really love. This um, this diagram that I have here is from our wheat ag mag, which you all should have gotten a copy of. And so this is a really cool thing to begin, you know, this lesson with is identifying the different parts of a wheat stalk um, before you get started. So what you guys all should have is a wheat stalk. And what you would do is you're just observing the different parts and you can have your students compare them to the label diagrams. You could have them compare and contrast the different varieties of, of wheat that we have um, and that are grown even in the United States and around the world. Um, but you're gonna break off the head um, from the stem and you can make straw out of the stem. So that's another opportunity to start talking about the uh, parts of the crop that are left behind after harvesting. Um, you could collect all of these, you could have them, you know, weave something small and start looking at those different uh, processes of weaving and what do we even use straw for in the end? What's the difference between straw and hay? There's a lot of different opportunities to have discussions with just um, this little, you know, the stem of this. Um, and so what you're going to start doing then is you can lay the wheat head flat on a hard surface and start patting it with your hands um, and shaking out the kernels. So the kernels should come out of the little pods. Um, and so then you can definitely, while they're doing this, start talking about the wheat milling process and, you know, the evolution of machinery that uh, farmers and, um, that, you know, anybody in the ag uh, industry has used to help make things go faster um, so that we can, you know, harvest and uh, produce a lot more of yield than, you know, what we used to have. Um, so you will have these little tiny kernels. I'm not sure if you can see this, but at the end, your students will have all of the little kernels out. 
Okay. And there's also different parts of the kernels that you could talk to them about and have them identify. Um, so one thing that we really like to do is, you know, we could have them, our students, uh, count how many kernels they have. For your younger students, you can start doing using these as manipulatives for math. So if you're practicing addition or subtraction, having them place the kernels on either side, you know, and um, working with that just as a fun way to, you know, use a different uh, material to help them learn um, you know, math and anything. Um, then what you can do is start talking about, well, what do we use uh, flour in or, or what, do, what do we use wheat in and what does it make? And so then you can talk about wheat flour and the different types of flour. And then to bring in some nutrition or some, um, you know, baking and, and cooking in here, we can look up some recipes um, that require uh, flour. And so what, um, what I really think is cool is if you look at different recipes, maybe, you know, your favorite cookies, look at the differences of the amount of flour that's needed. Well, and how many kernels are you going to need uh, to make that much flour for just one recipe? Um, and so we love these pepper grinders because you can put the kernels in there, um, just like, you know, the, the pepper um, corns that you put in there. And then you can, um, you know, add all of your students' kernels up. Uh, keep track of that on the board. You could even make it fun and have them uh, make a hypothesis on uh, how much um, flour is going to come from the kernels. Uh, and then that gives you an opportunity to start looking at different measuring units um, and then have them take turns grinding their kernels in one spot and then see how much um, flour was made out of just the small amount of uh, stalks that you guys had. And, and um, so there's a lot of fun things that you can do with just one stalk of wheat. So that is our wheat um, milling activity. Chris, is there anything I left out or that, that you talk about with your um, in your presentations? Well, you said to uh, to pat it on the on a surface. I just crush it up in my hand. That is much more <laughs> gratifying. So and messier. So I, I highly encourage just uh, just go for it, make a mess. Yeah, that that's uh, that's definitely what I would do. So. There I say that, but I don't have to clean up the mess in your classrooms. And so it's easy for me to say that, but. That's hilarious. Well, and you guys should see the difference between our desks. <laughs> Fair enough. <Yeah. laughs> I'm just messing. Okay. All right. So that is our wheat milling activity. All about wheat. Lots of fun stuff you can do with that. So Chris is going to take you into um, corn now. All right. So we have a biodegradable packing peanut lesson. And in this lesson, we're going to, you're actually going to use cornstarch in a microwave and you're going to actually be able to create um, some biodegradable packing peanuts. We sent you some in your kit. Uh, these are from a company called Uline. Uh, they're known for selling cardboard boxes and a lot of other business uh, industrial type supplies, but you can get a bag of these corn-based packing peanuts from them. And literally the bag is the size of a compact car. It lasts you a long time. Um, they're fairly inexpensive. And again, something that you could have for a while. Many of our county level, level ag literacy coordinators have these already, and you could get these for free from them. And so I would highly recommend uh, if you haven't already connected with your county level uh, ag literacy coordinator, their contact information is on our website. And uh, that would be a great source to get these and not have to worry about ordering them, them yourselves. The lesson here that we have is, is a good one. We've got a couple different versions of it where you actually create the packing peanut. And we also have a version of a lesson where you can uh, do an activity where you compare these biodegradable packing peanuts to uh, petroleum-based packing peanuts. And so you can put them in water and see how quickly these dissolve. Um, so it's a good activity with that. Um, the, the lesson where they actually make the packing peanuts, it works, it does, it, it, it works. It does what it's supposed to do. But if you wanna have students have a bunch of packing peanuts to be able to work with, I wouldn't recommend that lesson. It takes a little while to do it and um, you only get like two or three packing peanuts out of the lesson. So getting actual commercially made packing peanuts is, is probably the better choice. The interesting thing about two is these two is there's a lot of stem connections. And so this is a, a horse that Stephanie made. Uh, so basically you just moisten the end of these packing peanuts. Like you can see they stick together pretty, uh, pretty readily, right? And so there's lots of different things that we could ask students to do to create um, you know, creatures out of them. You can have them design the tallest tower they can, uh, try to build a bridge that would support some weight. I mean, there's all sorts of stem connections we could do with this. And also, again, connect it to, uh, to corn, another really important crop grown here in Illinois. So lots of great um, connections with that. Another great way to talk about sustainability as well and thinking about, you know, we have these crops that we grow here in Illinois. We can actually make products that are better for the environment because they biodegrade, but also are using a renewable resource as, as opposed to a non-renewable resource. So a lot of cool things to talk about there. 
uh, related to, uh, to, to biodegradable and bioplastics and those kind of things there. So that's our, uh, our biodegradable packing peanut lesson. Um, We've also got a video we're gonna show you here this morning. So in our office, we're technically part of the Illinois Center for Agricultural Engagement. And Stephanie and I work on the Ag in the Classroom side. And then we also have a consumer engagement side. And so that side of our office works with an organization called Illinois Farm Families. And it's a, it's a coalition of a number of different groups, including all the major commodity groups here in Illinois. So, so corn, soy, beef, dairy, and pork. And they all work together. And their goal is to try to educate consumers about what we're doing in agriculture here in Illinois. And they have this docu-series that they've been working on the last couple of years. And it, all the videos are really, really well done. They're very interesting. And they're all short, like three or four minutes long at the most. So we're gonna show you one about bioplastics. There's a number of others of these. Most of them have some kind of uh, like environmental connection to them. These would all be excellent to show in your classrooms and there's a lot of great information. Even if you just wanna watch them just to learn a little bit more yourself, um, that's why they're there obviously, but I think a lot of student uh, groups could, could benefit from seeing them too. So we're gonna show you here, uh, this is part of the Innovation Grows Here series and this is about bioplastics. Imagine if one day every water bottle could be made out of corn, a renewable resource. I feel like my generation as a whole has realized that we do use a lot of plastic and we are trying to limit that by using reusable straws rather than plastic ones and reusable cups and water bottles. My name is Alexis Hartman and I grew up on my family's grain farm in Waterloo, Illinois, where we grow corn, soybeans and wheat. Now I go to the University of Illinois where I major in agriculture and consumer economics. Most people don't realize that traditional plastic is made from petroleum. We're utilizing petroleum at a rate faster than what it can be replenished. My name is John Coppert, and we do corn-based research for companies in the private sector focused on bio-renewable products. We're taking corn as a single product and converting it into many products, one being bioplastics. Anything that utilizes a petroleum-based plastic could be replaced with a bio-based plastic today. Bio-based plastics are a better alternative to petroleum-based plastics because of the fact that they have a lower carbon footprint than petroleum-based plastics. I feel like a lot of people would be receptive to a plastic made from corn just because it's very renewable. We can grow it out in the fields, grow it for future generations. It's not something that will eventually run out. There absolutely is opportunity to do more. The surface has not even been scratched yet in the area of bio-renewables, and, and in particular, bioplastics. I think the only inconvenience that exists right now is just the simple fact that these bioplastics are just not as readily available yet as the petroleum-based plastics. But they will be, and every day, we're working to make that happen. So when I, about 20 years ago, when I was in college, uh, getting close to 20 years ago, I was the intern for the uh, Illinois Corn Growers Association. And I, that green mug that John held up there, I got a mug similar to that 20 years ago that was made from corn plastic. So this is not a, like a brand new revelation. This is something that's been being researched for, for decades now. And uh, they continue to make improvements to it and continue yeah. to try to find ways to, to bring it more readily into the market. Um, people often ask when we talk about this, like if it's been around this long, why why aren't we seeing more of it? Well, it's a it's a pretty vast supply chain and industry that, uh, admittedly, I know about this much about, and so it's it's a complicated industry. And, and think about it, 
if, if oil prices are cheap, there's not as much incentive for those companies um, to switch to a brand new plastic product, right? And so it, it takes research, it takes investment, and it takes time to, to get that in the marketplace. So I think you'll start to see more and more of that in the years to come. It seems like the interest is, is finally there on the consumer end, and uh, we're hoping to see more of that. Uh, to, you know, I think it's, it's better for the environment in a number of different ways. And so to watch for that, see if you start to see those bioplastic products out in the market a little bit more. We've got a couple other lessons that would work well if you wanted to do a little mini unit on some bioplastics. We have a lesson that you can make plastic out of soybeans. So that lesson plan is included on our blog page that has all these other resources from today. Um, we also have a milk plastic lesson um, that we don't have on here, but we'll make sure it's on the blog. And so we've talked about this before, but I have an example here that you might have to squint a little bit, but this is an evergreen tree that we used a cookie cutter. And as you can hear this, but it's, it's just hard plastic. And all you do is add vinegar to, a, to warm milk and it separates out um, what's called a casein protein. And then if you let it dry, it dries as hard as a plastic. So that's another kind of bioplastic you could look at. Uh, we also just finished this past week uh, a lesson called Ublek, where you make, if you're familiar with that term, Ublek, uh, it's kind of a, you know, a, a, a stickier plastic, a, a wet plastic, and you can uh, create that. We've got a lesson to do that as well. Um, we also have an indoor bingo activity here that um, isn't directly related to plastic, but the idea is that we're getting students to think more about the different co-products and byproducts that go along with the corn and soybean production and, and other things that we, that we grow and produce here in Illinois. And so it's basically asking them to go through their kitchen and find products that use uh, products from agriculture and ways that they maybe they didn't expect or they didn't realize. And so that indoor bingo activity would be a good take-home activity as well. Uh, again, all the resources for today are on uh, the teacher training tab on our blog. And before we're done today, we'll show you exactly how to get to that. So there's a number of activities related to bioplastics. Uh, that book, The Last Straw, there is a good one talking about um, reducing our use of single-use plastic and um, talks a little bit about bioplastics in there as well. And I do just want to add real quick. So when we're looking at the topic of bioplastics and corn-based corn plastics and everything that we just watched in the video, um, we're looking at this idea of progressing forward um, to become more sustainable. Now there are going to be, um, you know, some, there's pros and cons to everything. And so we're looking at, well, you know, in the end, is it going to break down as quickly? Is it, you know, what, what are the benefits? But what I love about the video is that we're looking at the initial process. It's, it's, De, um, it's really decreasing the amount of carbon dioxide that we're putting in the um, atmosphere. We're uh, using a renewable resource. That way, anything that's petroleum based, we can use those resources for other things like gasoline, you know, that we may need um, for, you know, all sorts of different things. But the, this, um, this idea of using uh, corn based plastics and just uh, bio based plastics in general has sparked interest around the world. And there are so many many cool studies um, going on in different countries using a lot of different uh, bio-based um ingredients um, from, you know, funguses to, you know, different tree barks and things that people are really trying to figure out how can we eliminate um, not only the amount of uh, emissions that we're putting in the atmosphere from creating petroleum-based plastics, but also in the end, um, if we're, we're decreasing our carbon footprint in the beginning of this process, what are different materials that we could be using that will break down more quickly um, and be more sustainable all the way around. And so um, this is something that many, many people around the world are interested in and see that there is an issue with the amount of plastic that we use for everything. Um, and so it, it's just, it's really cool to see what just one idea has sparked all around the world. So keep that in mind. And like Chris said, this has been going on for, you know, 20 plus years. Um, so, and we said this last week and the weeks before that, you know, science takes time and it takes time to make sure that the facts are straight and that, you know, the data is complete. Um, any science that comes out, you know, like super fast, um, it's, 
it's science, but we want to just make sure that the facts are straight. And that's why facts are super important. Um, but anyways, moving on, we have a really cool activity uh, about selective breeding. So looking at selective breeding with crops. Um, this lesson comes from a program called Nourish the Future. Um, very cool program. I encourage you all to get online and go to their website and check it out. There's a ton of different curriculum resources uh, that not only tie to agriculture, but just the environment and science in general. Um, and a lot of it is uh, teachers um, from around uh, the nation and um, submitting their lesson plan. So it's not just an organization. It's teachers who have taught these lessons who are, you know, it's a, it's a huge community of sharing resources. So I encourage you guys to check that out. But this, um, this is a selective breeding uh, lesson. Now, this specific lesson is more geared towards your eighth grade and high school. However, uh, you can definitely teach this at the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade lesson, especially um, middle school when you're really starting to look at meio meiosis and mitosis and, you know, cell division. Um, and so there's a case study. This activity is uh, revolved around this case study. And so you're trying to understand what are the advantages of selective breeding. So you're giving um, or your students are given this case study that talks about drought ranges. Um, this one specifically in Nebraska, you know, we're looking at the economic effects of drought that could be up to $9 billion um, in just one year of drought. Uh, looking at the economic impacts for just not even just the economy, but the farmers in general, um, because that is, that is their career. That's where they get their salary from. Um, and then we're also looking at the uh, direct and indirect impacts of other production, you know, for example, corn, um, and then the prices of animal feed and the entire supply chain, which we now know after a year of quarantine and COVID and, and the impacts um, on the supply chain. This is a really important thing for people to understand now so that we understand, you know, why, you know, something, you know, in the, in the supermarket, the shelves might not be, you know, completely full or what's happening. So this is a really cool idea um, or a, a lesson that you could definitely have those conversations with. Um, and then we're also looking at, well, what are the traits of these plants that will help reduce the effects of the drought. Um, so we're looking at strong root system, um, a resistance to rootworm, and then a resistance to seedling diseases. You know, so we're looking at these traits that are desirable uh, to help you know, if there is going to be a drought, we never know with the weather. And especially nowadays, it's starting to get a little bit more extreme with a lot of rain at one time and a lot of drought at the next. Um, and so farmers have to really uh, understand and, and be on the lookout for this. So we're looking at desirable traits. So what I would highly suggest is that your students have some sort of understanding of uh, cell function, um, you know, that we're made up of cells um, and the process of meiosis in terms of um, genetics when you're talking about reproduction and the traits. And then of course, mitosis as well, if you're getting into different systems. Um, so I'm not gonna go into detail with that. Um, but what I want you guys to do is you guys all have a little starburst. So this is a fun activity where your students, um, they have wrapped candy so they can do the activity. And then in the end, if they're on task and all that fun stuff, uh, they can have the candies and eat them since they're wrapped up. But what I want you to do is open up your package of starburst and take out all of the orange. You do not want any orange in there. And if you do this lesson, you know, in your classroom, um, you can you can pick and choose the colors. Um, this is just what this lesson has written up. So once you have all of your orange um, out, set those to the side and put all of your other starburst into a cup. Okay, so all of your starbursts are going into a cup. Now, the reason I had you guys grab two cups is because typically um, in your classroom, when your students are doing this, they only have their one cup. Um, but when we're looking at genetic traits and, and breeding uh, plants, um, they would need another plant to breed with. But we're just doing this by ourselves. So I had you get two cups just so you can get the idea. So I want you to shake these up and without looking, uh, draw out three of your candies. Okay, you got three out, set them in front of you. Okay, my candies I drew out were pink, yellow, and pink. So I've got two pink and one yellow. 
Okay, now no cheating. I can't see any of you, so don't try to pick and choose your traits. So your students will get a package or a packet um, that has the directions in here and it'll have this table. And we're looking at a dominant trait. So again, for your higher grades, when you're starting to get into the, the difference between a dominant and recessive gene, um, and looking at when you're writing these out, you've got the capital letters and the lowercase letters, we are looking at um, these dominant traits. So um, these are the different combinations that you will have. Uh, so mine is pink, pink, yellow. So my corn plant has rootworm resistance and seedling diseases resistance. So at the bottom of the chart, it's going to tell you what each color represents in terms of these desired traits. Okay. So the red uh, candy is, um, is representing a, uh, a gene on the allele that is uh, that codes for a strong root resistance. The yellow is going to be the seedling disease resistance. And then the pinks are going to be the rootworm. So what you're going to do is then you would uh, keep track of which, um, which traits your specific corn plant has. Now, I want you to go ahead and put those three candies um, into your second jar. That's empty, put those back in there. And now what I want you to do is then go back to your original jar with that you put the whole pack in and draw three more and set that to the side. So you have three more candies. Go back to your charts. You can see, you know, what your second corn stalk has. Okay, mine, this one has two yellows and a red. So I have a strong root system and seedling diseases resistance. So both of my candies, or both my candies, both of my corn parent plants, my corn stalks, um, have seedling diseases resistance. That's the yellow. Okay, one parent plant has multiple. Uh, genes from that. And um, the other one only had one. Um, and then one parent plant had um, strong root system and the other parent plant had rootworm resistance. So what you're going to do is that would, you would have, we're going to pretend that these are two separate um, uh, two separate students uh, candies. They looked through them. They saw what their plants were. So you're going to put them all in the same. So the three you just drew out, put them into that second cup that you had put your first plant parent in. Shake them up. And then you're going to draw three from there. Okay. Now this is your offspring. Okay. So my offspring is very similar to my first parent plant. Okay. Now I, I kind of already had the understanding that I'd probably be yellow because I had a lot of yellow candies in there, a lot of that seedling disease resistance, um, those, those traits. And then I um, drew the pink. So this is a really good way to start that idea or that discussion um, of meiosis and how the traits you get um, from offspring, no matter what the offspring is, they're getting those traits from their parents. And I wanna go back and I just wanna say that this, um, this book that we have right here um, about Gregor Mendel, um, awesome, awesome book for students to, to start learning about genetics and um, Mendel's key plants and, and what the traits are, the dominant and recessive and, and how that all works, looking at um, the idea of Punnett squares. Um, this is a fantastic book. Um, that I, I think that you could even use in a sixth grade classroom. I think it's a fantastically written book. The diagrams in there are awesome and really, you know, hit uh, some of those key parts that are, you know, when we're thinking about genetics and all this stuff, it is really hard for students to understand. There's a lot to it, um, but using something as simple as candies and you could even have them lay it out. Okay, so who, you know, what were uh, both of the genetics of the parent plant and then looking at the genetics from um, the offspring and and how did they get those combinations? So the cool thing about this activity is then, um, and we gave you the packet um, of the instructions uh, in your box, and it goes through all the procedures that the students need to go through. Um, and it's talking about, okay, so then what characteristics does your new plant have? Where did they get these characteristics? And then looking at this idea of selective breeding. So if your offspring 
you know, if, if you really want a strong root system, strong root systems, you know, are really desirable because um, those root systems really support the healthy plant. Um, healthy plant, uh, healthy roots help carry up the water and nutrients. So if you're having a drought, they are going to be strong, not only holding them in place. And, you know, when we're thinking about impacts like erosion, but we're also talking about the ability to pull in nutrients um, and water uh, from the soil that may not have gotten rain for, you know, a couple of different weeks. And so, you know, my offspring doesn't have that trait, but me as a farmer, I think that's really important for my specific farm and the location where I am and the weather and climate here in my location. Now, not all farmers may not need these, you know, these desirable traits. Like we said last week, it really depends on your location and your specific farm and the climate in that area. There's a lot of, it's not a one glove fits all. Um, so this is where you get into that idea and that discussion of selective breeding. Okay. So if I wanted, um, corn plants, uh, you know, I'm, I don't, you know, have problems with, you know, rootworms and all of that. I would rather have stronger roots with uh, seedling disease resistance because a part of those diseases could be the rootworm. And so that could also help eliminate or, or decrease, you know, any problem with rootworms. Um, and so, you know, we're looking at this idea of selecting the traits uh, that we want to make sure that we have the desired yield at the end of the season. Um, not only because this is where our former salary come from, but we have an increasingly growing population. I mean, we have a population that is increasing very, very quickly. We have to have enough uh, food and enough plants um, to make all of the products that we make with this um, so that we can make sure that uh, we're feeding not only the United States, but where we export, you know, we have exports and imports, but we want to make sure everybody has enough food. And if we're seeing a change in weather patterns and climate, if we're seeing increased um, you know, uh, fungi and different diseases, um, we need to, we need to do something about that. Okay. And um, we have to take care of it. So this is the idea of where you're selecting these traits. Now, any of you guys out there who are either familiar with genetics, um, or, uh, teach, uh, genetics at any level, you know, that different traits are found among many different alleles in your genes and not just one. So this is actually a really tough process because these three traits that we're looking at are not found on just one allele. And those can be the ones that are selected. They're found, you know, um, among many different alleles in these genes. Um, so this is just a really cool idea to really start talking about, you know, the, um, you know, what farmers have to do when they're trying to select the seed that they, uh, that they need, they have to look ahead. They're looking at, you know, all of the different, um, weather patterns from the last X amount of years, um, X amount of days and months, and they're keeping track of all of that so that they are choosing the correct crop to plant, you know, in their fields to make sure that they have, you know, a desired um, yield. Um, lots of cool information that you can talk with this. Now, another thing that you could um, get into with your higher level kiddos, we're talking like eighth grade or even high school, um, this conversation would be appropriate for those grades is, you know, then what is the difference between selective breeding and um, GMOs? So what are GMOs? What uh, crops currently would be considered GMO? Um, and why are we doing this? Um, and what are the pros and cons? Because there are a lot of positive outcomes with um, doing this sort of studying when we're thinking about the imagined changes. But, you know, what are what are some of the um, possible, you know, cons and the outcomes when we're thinking about, OK, we're just changing one little protein, but that protein could, you know, in the end, you know, have an issue. It's not going to do anything with our DNA. That's not how any of that works, but there's a lot of cool conversations that you can have, which then could even lead into conversations of labeling food packages. Cause there's a lot of things out there right now that will say you know, organic or non GMO. And, you know, there's not very many plants that are considered GMO and that are used in any of the products that, um, you know, we're buying. So just be aware of that, but that's a good conversation to have. Um, and a cool way to look at not only genetics, uh, but also then this idea of selective breeding and then look into what other crops, uh, currently what other foods do we eat, um, that are, uh, 
that have been created from this process of selective breeding. So look into like uh, broccoli and cauliflower and, you know, that family. And then you could even take it to the next, um, the next level and talk about, you know, dog species. We, we selectively breed different dog species. So we have this desired outcome of different breeds of animals. So um, there's a lot of different conversation that you can have just with this one lesson. So that is our selective breeding. Uh, thanks to nourish the future. Um, and if there's nothing else, Chris, that you want to add, um, well, go ahead and I'll, talk about I'll just a little bit here. So, you know, this, this lesson targets specific traits that we're, that we're looking for related to these plants. But when you think about when we try to create new varieties of plants, there's a lot of different traits that we would, that we would potentially selectively breed for. So I'll give you another example. We talked about wheat earlier, typically farmers who grow wheat, uh, Right now in Illinois, the wheat harvest is pretty much finishing up. And so those, those fields are going to be empty. And so typically what farmers would do is they would plant soybeans after the wheat. Well, think about when you're driving around now, you see soybean fields that were planted months ago. So those farmers are going to need a really short season soybean that's going to create a bean in a, in a shorter window of time. Again, researchers have been selectively breeding soybeans to make sure that they can grow in a shorter season to allow them to be able to be harvested in that time window. So there's lots of different variations of this. And it also depends too on, on how the product is going to be used as well. And what the, what the end product is gonna be is we're gonna selectively breed to, to, to be able to have the best product for that as well. So uh, next week, we're gonna start talking about specialty crops. There's a number of really interesting things that, that we do with specialty crops in particular. Uh, including grafting two different species together, two different varieties of the same plant together to get a desired outcome. So they're selectively really breeding two different varieties and then combining them together once they've started growing. So lots of cool stuff going on with that. And uh, yeah, some really, some really great science connections. And as Stephanie said, a lot of, a lot of these issues are, are currently in the, in the media and in, in people's buying decisions. And so it's a great opportunity to kind of start talking to students a little bit about that and help them better understand um, all the research and processes that go into all these things to try to, to, try to feed us. So. All right, so we're going to go on to, uh, this is just a, an idea generator. We did last summer, we did a build a tractor uh, contest and had a lot of people enter from around the state. We gave away prizes for the winners and um, it turned out to be a really, a really cool thing. And so this is just another kind of STEM related activity. We're not going to do this build a tractor contest um, this year anyway, we may do it again in the future, but something um, you might want to try at your school if you're doing any of these lessons and trying to connect to agriculture, this would be another great way to, uh, to talk a little bit about that and to inspire some kind of STEM building as well. So we'll show this short video that we made last summer, again, just to, to give you an idea of a, a possible project you could do in your classroom this year. So again, just a cute idea for you, um, something that we had students around the state really enjoyed last year. And so it's another idea for you to incorporate some of these things in your classroom. So, all right, as we kind of start to, to come to a close here, we wanted to remind you, uh, we do have, uh, we sent you copies of our, our, our row crop ag mags, uh, including our brand new corn ag mag. We also have these new ag venture sheets. They're one page activity sheets that we came up with to, uh, they're all cross curricular. Um, they all uh, require some uh, language art skills. Some have math skills, some have science skills. And it's a way to kind of interact with our ag mags. Uh, also a, a really great, if you're looking for, you know, an ex extra extension activity, if you know you're gonna be uh, needing a sub that week and it's something you can extend the lesson you started, it's a great way to bring that into your classroom too. Uh, the corn ag venture is done. However, the online interactive version of our ag mag is not ready yet. And so as soon as we get that up on the website, we'll add that as well. Um, and uh, we're just waiting to get the links established on that. And so again, you can get all of our ag mags on our website. 
Um, they, they are clickable. They do have links to external resources and videos and things like that. And then you can also get uh, classroom sets of the paper copies, again, from your county level ag literacy coordinator. They are free. They come in classroom packs of 30. And uh, we would encourage you to, to get those. Uh, you can order those anytime and uh, your ag literacy coordinator will get those to you to use in your classroom. So some other resources that go with row crops there. Uh, and then finally, we've got a couple of uh, upcoming. Oh, oh, Chris, I just wanted to I just wanted to add one quick thing is that um, and I don't think I mentioned this before. All of our uh, activities um, like this, all of our ag ventures, they do come with a teacher key. Um, so you don't have to do any prep work and try to you know find all the answers, which is, you know, always best as teachers to know so that you can help out your students. But and one last thing, all of the games on the bottom, if you have an ag venture that has some sort of game like a crossword puzzle or a word search, um, it's whether, you know, I know some teachers like games and some teachers are kind of hesitant, but these, um, the, the questions you have to, they're actual questions that you have to find the clue or find the word, and then the student has to find it in the word search or then um, put it in there. So it, it's working a lot with nonfiction text and reading, you know, headlines and titles and finding that information first and then being able to find the game. So I did have questions about that with um, my last um, SAI uh, presentation. So I just, just wanted to mention that in there. All right, some upcoming opportunities here. Uh, tomorrow actually is the first session of our summer book club. So I'm doing a book club for two books. You're gonna pick one of the two books. We have The Thing About Luck, which is about wheat. Uh, and then Flip the Bird is a book about falconry. Uh, and then might not seem like a, an obvious ad connection, but there's a lot of different treatment of animals and animal husbandry and themes like that in the books. We're gonna make some ag agriculture connections with that book. So tomorrow night at 6.30, we're gonna join on Zoom. We're going to talk a little bit. We're going to introduce ourselves. And then you're going to pick one of these two books to read. Uh, by the next morning, I will mail you whichever book you choose for free. And then uh, we'll come together the first week of August. And we'll meet again one night for each of those two books. And uh, we'll talk about the book. We'll have uh, some games and some giveaways and things to go with that, too. It should be a fun time uh, and should be something that uh, um, give you some ideas for your classroom this next year. We'll also create some reading guides for each of those books. So we'll basically give you uh, the beginnings of a unit plan that you can use to teach those books in your classroom. So the link is there to sign up for that. Uh, again, the first session is tomorrow. So you need to sign up today for, in order for me to give you all the, uh, the link information to get on Zoom with us uh, tomorrow. For that, uh, we are sending books to Illinois classroom teachers only. So if you're out of state or you're not a classroom teacher, if you'd like to participate, you're welcome to. You'll just need to purchase a book on your own uh, and you can still feel free to participate. Uh, another opportunity we have is Stephanie's hosting a Get a Grant workshop. We have two different grants, uh, a, a program grant, a uh, project grant, excuse me, and then also a book grant. And so uh, the project grants are $300, the book grants are $250. Stephanie's going to host a workshop. Um, I think it's uh, the Thursday, the first week of August at 10 a.m. And uh, she's going to give you some ideas on how to best apply for those grants, uh, some tips and tricks. She's going to talk about past recipients and try to give you some ideas. And then she'll also have a lesson booklet that has ideas that connect with all the different books that we have as part of the book grant. So lots of resources there. So again, feel free to sign up for either of those coming up here in the next couple of weeks. And then finally, uh, if you want to fill out the reflection, uh, when you get, uh, when you get, when the webinar ends, it should take you directly to this page. If it doesn't, for some reason, uh, you can go to this link right here. Uh, again, it's under the teacher training tab on our blog, and then it should be the second one down, should be the correct link to go to, uh, to be able to uh, fill out the reflection, and then it will send you a certificate of completion as well. If you are not signed up for our final block of our summer virtual training, the specialty crop block, I'm super excited about some of the activities we have coming up with that. Uh, if, if you haven't, if you don't remember from me talking previously, I have a lot of interest in specialty crop production, so I'm excited for these last two weeks. And so please sign up for that. If you haven't already, we'd love to have you. And same, same thing, we'll send you a box if you attend the first session. All right, all this stuff is uh, on our website, on our blog. If you haven't already, follow us on Instagram and Facebook. We post there regularly and have give you another uh, number of other ideas and then resources on there as well. All right, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you being with us here this morning. Uh, if you have any other questions, please use that Q&A feature and we will stick around for another minute here to uh, see if we can answer any questions from you. If not, thank you so much for joining us.